you know, it helps them relate to those events more. It helps them learn more from those events. So I thought it was... Sorry? Oh, I just... No? Oh, okay. so, no, uh, I, I heard some, like, I don't know. Some an noise. alien has joined us on the podcast, right. I think. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. hello, alien. <laughs> All right. <laughs> six of the green light green light if you're new here basically what we do is read unproduced short plays and screenplays and interview the awesome people who wrote them yes that is exactly what we do jumping right into it i love it yeah so just for a few little housekeeping things before we get started um if you have listened to this podcast and have loved this podcast i think it might be around time it might behoove you yeah, it's Two. you know it's high time that you help us out just a little bit. Just a little lady baby. And oh, you're so weird. <laughs> just help us out a little bit and give us a five star review on iTunes. So hey, please. reviews actually hold a little more weight than just a blank five star rating. Mm-hmm. You could literally put two words in that review: great pod. It, it really does not matter what you say. Fun um, time. As long as you write something that just carries more weight in getting us up the charts and helping our Big podcast. Big boys. I'm just giving people examples of what two words they can oh, use. Okay. <laughs> uh, you uh, looked at me like I was so foolish, and you were correct. Well, I was like, am I going to have to restart this again? Big um, boys. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, it'll just help us reach more people with the podcast mm-hmm. if you give us a review and actually write literally anything. Mm-hmm. Um, Specifically, if you want to, if you want to roast your boy here, Jackson right. Campbell, please do. And we will read it on this podcast. You can make your debut on this podcast. Wow. Lauren will read it. She will roast me. That's and it'll right. be a, a, you don't a fun even, old time. You don't even have to write a play. You can just write a review where you roast Jackson mm-hmm. or give us your detour of the week, some content that you consume yeah. that you think is awesome that you would recommend, mm-hmm. and a little bit of why. Uh, and we will talk about that too. Now, if you do want to write a little bit more than a review, if you want to write something like a play mm-hmm. or a screenplay mm-hmm. that's roughly 10 minutes... And hopefully it doesn't have too many characters because we are in a closet. (laughs) Um, Please send us your scripts. We would absolutely love to read as many scripts as you want to send us. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can send those to tglsubmit at gmail.com. We also wanted to give a little bit of a shout out to YouTube Music. Uh, Many people know about the YouTube Music Library. Mm -hmm. You can use lots of free music. Uh, We've been using those for our intros and our transitions and everything the past couple weeks. It's pretty great. Uh, there is literally so much stuff on there that hopefully it doesn't sound like the same stuff that every YouTuber uses in their videos. <laughs> Even though it probably will. Probably. It probably is about the same. But uh, we have been using them the past couple of weeks. But as always, the invitation is open that if you have any music that you've written. Mm-hmm. So maybe you picked up the ukulele, as Amanda Palmer always suggests. Mm-hmm. Um, if and you have you, a band, you wrote a tune, a garage yeah. band. Yeah, if you would like to submit any music to us for consideration to be used in the transitions, uh, you can also send that to tglsubmit at gmail.com. And we would encourage you to do so. Look at the art we're encouraging. Yay! Play screenplays, music, roasting of me. That's right. All three on the same level, I think. Yeah. <laughs> All three equal in the Lord's eyes. Of course. Alrighty. Uh, some other art that we would like to promote. Our detours of the week. <laughs> I really didn't know where you're going there. I was holding my breath. I'm like, oh, she's going off script. Oh no! <laughs> Listen, I've been I've been doing these segues like you have. You've been, been great. transitioning seamlessly. Ooh. So I I ruined that for you. Anyways, yeah. Detours of the week. So this is a segment we do every week where we give you a uh, a TV show, a movie, a book, something that we have watched that we would recommend to you. We offer up our recommendations so that you can then enjoy them in the same way that we have. Yay. So, should I start? Yes. Cuz I yeah, so mine, my first one is something that Lauren and I have seen. Second one is sort of Lauren specific. Then we're going <laughs> to wrap it up with another Jackson and Lauren together. Yeah. Wow. So, a little late, I guess, because this came out Months ago, ago, many, many moons ago, The Mandalorian on Disney Plus. Fabulous. It is. It's great. So just in case you don't know, um, it's it's Star Wars. We're, we're looking at Star Wars here. Yeah. Um, so this, it exists in the time. So it's between the 
original trilogy and the most recent trilogy. So five years after Return of the Jedi, 25 years before The Force Awakens, it is written and created by Jon Favreau, which is who, really cool. Who is not the Jon Favreau who is one of the hosts on Pot Save America, as Correct. I found out. My well, mind was blown for a second. Well, I would say most people would probably know this Jon Favreau I mean, over yes, that Jon Favreau, that's but fair. <laughs> I digress. So. There are a lot of cool things about this show. It's not just uh, a money grab, in my opinion, at least. I think it's really cool. It is... So I, I, was, I was doing a little research on it just so I could talk about it well. And Ooh. it is... Its specific genre is space western. And I guess I hadn't really thought about that before. Yeah. But it, it really is. It's, it's a, it is a western TV show. There following, are showdowns. You yeah. Know, there, there are uh, high-speed... S- space chases. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Instead of horse chases. Sure. You know, there's sure. um, racism, <laughs> just like in <laughs> westerns. There we go. <laughs> there it it's got it all, folks. It's got it all. But yeah, and so you, we sort of follow this main character of the Mandalorian, who is a bounty hunter, and so his main job is to collect bad guys, and in return, he receives a sum of money. So to- sort of towards the beginning of the series, he is set out on this task. Does he? He doesn't know what he's going to collect, does he? Well, he knows. So he knows that he has to bring back someone who is fifty years old. Yes, that's and about so, all he knows. He knows so where the thinking, target is. He has a locator fob. Yeah. So you're thinking fifty years old? That's probably an old guy or someone who at least at least looks like an old guy or looks like a grown person at <laughs> least. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Incorrect. You come to find out that as many of you probably know and you at least know of this character even if you haven't watched the show, it is in fact Baby Yoda is the person Yoda. that he comes. Baby Yoda is not child, his technical name. Yes, the child is his technical name, but colloquially he is known as Baby Yoda. And so, you know, originally he's like, "Okay, I'm just going to take this back and get my money." And so he takes it back to Werner Herzog, who plays, I don't know his character's name, but it's the director, actor, Werner Herzog. Werner Herzog. Um, And so he takes him back, and then he grows a conscious, and he's like, I don't want to give this literal child away. Yeah, like, we don't know what it's going to be used for. It can be experimented on or enslaved or Mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah, so instead, he keeps it for himself. Slight spoilers, I guess, if you haven't seen. That's like the first episode. Yeah, it's, it's pretty quick. And so... Pretty much then on, it's sort of him learning how to be a dad in a way. Yeah. Like, it's it, it obviously, there's still the space western genre, so there's still a bunch of action, a bunch of conflict, but one of the really cool things and one of the things I liked about it is it isn't just that, you know traditional western it's like bad guy versus good guy we're gonna have a duel boom you're dead you know it's instead follows this sort of kind of really heartwarming story of this sort of hardened bounty hunter becoming this like nice father figure to this to this kid who he you know just recently found yeah really cool i'm sure you've seen memes everyone listening of baby yoda Baby if Yoda is even cuter. <laughs> Baby Yoda is, he's adorable. There's a lot of great humorous moments with Baby Yoda, really mm-hmm. funny. And I, I, I enjoy the action. I wouldn't say it's necessarily groundbreaking, you know, the action sequences. Yeah. But it, it, it is pretty cool. Pedro Pascal is really good as the Mandalorian. There's a lot of cool characters. Obviously, it's the Star Wars universe, you know. Yeah. So you're going to get some some fun creatures, some fun characters having to do with that. And yeah, it's it's overall it's a, it's a pretty solid show. Um, even I would say even if you don't love Star Wars, like I I've seen all the Star Wars movie, but I'm not movies, but I'm not like a huge huge fan like some people are. I still think you can get a lot out of this. Probably For even sure. if you haven't seen anything Star Wars, like it helps. Yeah, well, because but... it is kind of like you know they do mention oh Imperial whatever and like stuff like that. Yeah. But it's really more of a you know like they show stormtroopers, but it's more of a reference to. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the original trilogy, as opposed to, you know, you don't really have to know about Star Wars to know what this is about. It's just kind of helpful to see some of those like Easter eggs that appeared in Mm -hmm. previous Star Wars movies, you know? But even still, you can get a whole lot out of it without having seen it. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, uh, you kind of talked about, you know, the Mandalorian learning to be a dad. Mm -hmm. And something that I really liked about it was that, you know, the stakes are always really high in uh, Star Wars movies, but Mm -hmm. usually it's on the scale of a whole planet being destroyed, you know, mass genocide. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the stakes felt the same, but the life we were protecting was just this one little kid. 
mm-hmm. who was Baby Yoda, you know. And the Mandalorian really sacrifices so much of what he's worked for and sacrifices his reputation with the guild and just so much of what he spent his life doing to protect this one life that he thought was being, you know, taken unjustly, mm-hmm. I guess. Um, yeah, so it's just really well done. Yeah, that's a very good point, Lauren. I, I appreciate that quite a Thank bit. You. And okay, so yeah, Mandalorian, great. Check it out if you haven't. It's on Disney Plus. So if you have a Disney Plus subscription, you can watch it for free. Yes. Okay, Lauren. <sighs> now, to go into something that is even more groundbreaking, oh, I gosh. think, than The Mandalorian. Wow. Um, okay, so there's this game mm. for Wii mm. that came out in like, what, 2009? Something like that? Don't like, ask 2009, me. I have 2010. No idea. <laughs> It's called the Dog Island, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. And it's, um, mm-hmm. so the mechanics of the game, it's made by the same companies that did a game I grew up with called Pets Dogs 2. All those words have a Z in them. Not two, <laughs> that's just the number two. Two starts with a Z. Z-T-W-O. <laughs> two. <laughs> yes. Um, but, you know, the mechanics are very similar in terms of just how the dogs move, how you fish, how you sniff things, you know. Um, so I was like, cool, I'm going to get on board with this game, The Dog Island, that, uh, one of, that Tori, actually, who you've met a couple times, yes. uh, is, she's very passionate about this game and about the theme song specifically. Oh boy, is she. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Many um, a time in our home have we, have I just been just hanging out and I just hear Lauren and Tori screaming at the top of their lungs, the introduction song. I've learned it anyway. by how many times it has been sung profusely in okay. this home. Well, anyway, um, so on a very like disappointing note, Pets Dogs 2 is, it turns out, the exact same game as Pets Cats 2, which I recently bought for yeah. two-ish dollars on yeah. eBay. Um, but Dog Island is very different. So Dog Island is heavy for a kid's game. It really okay? is. There is, like, the whole premise of it, right at the beginning, your brother or sister, you can choose which one, is very very sick like has this horrible uncurable disease they like faint at this festival that's right at the beginning of the game and you are sent to the dog island to find dr potan i don't know if that's how you pronounce his name that's how i pronounce his Mm, name probably whatever (laughs) who is you know this kind of esteemed doctor you have to fight through a storm you know you literally abandon ship in the middle of a storm and just hope for the best and swim to the dog island in a storm Like, just because you are trying to save your sister's life or your brother's life, whichever one. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, right off the bat, it's pretty heavy for a kid's thing. And then, you know, there's a whole part, probably the saddest point in the whole thing is that, you know, at one point you don't know where the doctor is. So you've kind of talked to him a little bit. You have to gather specific materials to treat your sister and you don't know where he is. You eventually find him and he's staring at a headstone that was, that belonged to, you know, this, this, uh, woman that he was trying to, I mean, not a woman, but like a dog who was a girl <laughs> that he was Female planning dog. to marry, you know, and it's so sad. And there are all these things, there are all mm. of these enemies you have to face. There yeah. are like snakes and bears and gorillas and like all kinds of animals that you have to try to avoid. And, and you are a small dog with a giant head. You are a small dog with a giant head. It is based on, you know, the, the dog artwork. Right, I think the, the dogs with the giant heads. I think that also has a Z. The dogs, right? Really? Dogs. Well, I don't know. This dogs? game is just the dog island. Maybe so there not. is no Z. Hold on. But um, in any case, so it's just, it's a fun game. It's a very compelling game. It's not difficult to figure out because it's a kid's game. I usually like games that aren't really that difficult <laughs> or that scary. So kids games are usually the move for me. Um, but if you are looking for something to do in quarantine... Um, I don't know exactly the price for this game, what it's going for, but it's been pretty easy to find very cheap Wii games for me. Cheap, old, you know, 10-year-old Wii games. And I highly recommend this game. Mm-hmm. I, I have not played it myself, but Lauren got an infinite amount of joy out of it, so I'm yeah. sure <laughs> it was great. you will too. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have one more together. Yes. It's getting hot in this closet, so we might make it quick. Yeah. But... There's something much heavier than the Dog Island. Yeah, unfortunately. We probably shouldn't have ended with this one in hindsight, but it's whatever. So, uh, currently on Netflix now, streaming as we speak, is a documentary series, four episodes, about an hour long each episode, titled Jeffrey Epstein, Filthy Rich. And as the title indicates, it is about Jeffrey Epstein and sort of... was filthy. Was filthy. Yes. Also rich. So title... Title very, very explanatory. And yeah. So 
basically this is like a four hour long documentary series about a psychopath abusing his power and status that like in a way that infinitely harms probably hundreds of women. Yeah. Well, the thing by, is, you know, by the end, they found um, most of the people that they talked about that he sexually abused were minors at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So background, a little bit of background on Jeffrey Epstein. Um, they go through this in the documentary. It's, it's kind of, I thought it was really crazy how his sort of life began. Uh, he started off as a teacher when, you know, right. I think he dropped out of college, yeah. then became a teacher at a private school. He was fired because his performance was what he fired for poor performance. And then immediately after that, he was hired by Bear Stearns, which is a global investment bank. And he lied about his qualifications. Yeah, which makes sense why he was hired. But at the same time, it's like, how do you go from teacher to investment banker and it like makes sense how do you play that i think th- there's obviously like he's obviously a and i put this in quotations charming guy you know like a lot of psychopaths are it's yeah. like that that's a qualification yeah. is they're able to charm people into getting them to do what they want and there's so many instances of jeffrey epstein doing this and yeah. also just abusing his power in order to get what he wants absolutely well because you know so many times the women you know the now women who were children at the time um, just felt like they couldn't speak out and they couldn't do anything because he was too powerful. There are so many instances of him getting around, um, actually serving jail time, mm-hmm. you know, and facing the consequences for his actions because of his money and power and connections. Um, they talk about uh, pretty extensively something that they call a um, molestation pyramid scheme, right? Which is yeah. where he would literally get all of these you know, teenage or even sometimes preteen girls to come to his property in West Palm Beach and, you know, under the premise that they would be making $200 to give this wealthy middle-aged man a massage. And most of them only thought that it was going to be a massage. Mm -hmm. And then he would, you know, basically do things. He would touch them, touch himself, whatever, you know, just abuse them and abuse his power in that situation. And then he would pay those girls to also recruit other girls to come. And, you know, it was, he would always just take advantage of girls who had bad home lives, who were in really vulnerable situations. People who didn't have a lot of money oftentimes. I mean, a lot of them were girls who had been homeless at some point in Mm -hmm. their lives. You know, their, their very short lives up to that point. Um, yeah. So just a really, really horrible guy. Yeah. So, no. yeah, like I like I mentioned at the beginning, four episodes, about an hour long each. And I, at first I I was like I was talking to Lauren after we watched it and I was like, you know, they they tell the same story over and over again. And I was like, could they have made it shorter? But Lauren made a really good point that it's like, you know, the length almost mirrored, you know, this documentary was four hours, but it could have been. 30 hours, you know, going through each and every person's story. So the length kind of mirrored the extent to which Jeffrey Epstein abused people and abused his power and abused the the United States judicial system, everything like that. And so, oh, and I I wouldn't say it ever gets boring either, you know, like it it stays intriguing. Kind of at least the first two to three episodes, it goes through, it almost goes through a different location where Jeffrey Epstein either had a house or he owns a private island. So it goes through a different locations and then obviously different stories along with those locations. But overall, yeah, it's, um, it is an informative watch. It is a, um, it is a useful watch, but it it is not necessarily an enjoyable. Yeah. 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 And I mean, kind of going off of that, you know, you hear the same story over and over about how, um, you know, I thought I was going to give him a massage. I went, he did all of these things that were not appropriate. I felt like I couldn't do anything because he was this really powerful guy. I just felt like I had to go along with it. Um, that story over and over and over. So, you know, it's all, it's all different variations of the same thing. And it really just gives you the scope of what was going on. And, you know, it also talks about, it was, it was interesting because just recently there were those, um, court indictments for Trump and Epstein that Mm -hmm. were leaked. Yeah. And, you know, from Epstein's perspective, it was very much the same story. You know, this girl, like the the Jane Doe, um, thought that she was going to be giving him a massage. And it was definitely interesting to see, oh, yeah, this has happened dozens, if not hundreds of times to different girls and Mm -hmm. many of them on multiple occasions. Um, 
yeah, so it's a tough read, but an, or not a tough read, tough a tough watch. watch, but a necessary and educational watch. Um, so that wraps up our detours. Do, yeah, when we come back, we are going to be reading. Living History by Ellie Baker, who we oh, met yeah. in the first episode. Yeah, we we failed to mention that at the beginning of the episode. Uh, but yeah, Ellie Baker is coming back on. So yeah. super exciting. This is See, a very different script than the last one she wrote. So it is. we're really excited It'll to share it. It'll be super it. cool. It's also interesting because we talked to Ellie, because, you know, we, rec- we pre-recorded three episodes before we released any, and hers mm-hmm. was the first episode we recorded. So it's actually been months since we've uh, yeah. we talked to her. She so was be... here. Like, quarantine wasn't a thing yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which can tell you how long it was since we yeah. had talked to her. But yeah, so after the break, we will be reading Living History by Ellie Baker. by Ellie Baker. I'm Lauren. I'm going to be reading Stage Directions. Mm -hmm. And I am Jackson. I'm going to be reading one of the characters. But before we get into that, we're going to welcome back Lauren's laptop. Sorry, my computer made a noise. We're going to welcome back Lauren's laptop. Uh, Silence your cell phones, everyone. I to see who we... Um, So we'll do that next time. Yes. Oh, and making his appearance on the podcast, Jacob Wishnick, back again. Welcome back, Jacob. How are you? I, you know, I'm, I'm, do, I'm a little toasty, but thumbs up and audible it is, thumbs up. It is, a, it is a warm room that we have, and I love it the is. audible thumbs up. Thank you for keeping it. And we also have with us everybody, Blake D. Benson. Hello, I was just turning my computer as loud as it can go. <laughs> <laughs> we need one as loud as it can go, one as soft as it can go, and then a couple in the middle. So there you go. Perfectly balanced as all things should be. Blake, yeah. are you doing well as the official third host of this podcast? Right? I'm offended, but I'm doing great. <laughs> Okay, good, good. Um, so yeah, we'll be reading Living History, like Lauren said, and you can you can sort of take things from there, Lauren. Yeah, so I'm going to be reading Stage Directions. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will be reading for Jonathan, a former war correspondent. I'll be reading for Christopher, a former military surveillance. And I'll be reading Man, a wounded voice off stage. At rise, lengths of barbed wire scrawl across the stage. In the distance, we hear men shouting and bombs dropping. We are on the edge of the Battle of the Scheldt, Belgium, 1944. Lights up. A new sound arrives, one that doesn't fit in here. A high-tech, electronic-sounding beam. Vroom, vroom, vroom. John, 52, stumbles on stage. He wears dark clothing that makes him easy to miss. He fiddles with a gadget we can't see yet. He's anxious. If the Casimir plates are just overheated, or it's the Alcubierre compressor. What do you think? He turns around. No one's there. Christopher? Christopher! What? Oh, sorry. Christopher, 43, hurries on stage. He's similarly dressed and carries a camera. Before reaching John, he stops to take another picture of the offstage battle, looking enthralled with it. Will you take a look at this? I can't tell if it's the Casimir or Alcubierre on this thing, but it's got us in a locked interval. Christopher blinks. He doesn't understand a word of that science stuff and never will. One time slower. You really need to learn this. I know how to work it. But you don't know how to fix it. When we get back, I'll take a refresher class. What's wrong with it? Don't use jargon. The time machine's overheated. We're stuck here for nine more minutes. All right, so we take a break. He takes a seat on the ground and fiddles with this camera, flipping through the pictures. We're... You realize that that is one of the deadliest battles of World War II. Yeah, but the good guys win this one. Look, I changed the aperture when a mortar went up. Look at the lights. Time Magazine's gonna love this one. It's not my point. We'll be fine. He tosses another gadget to John, who takes it and reads through the hologram display. I check the field research packet. They've scouted this whole area. Nothing's gonna come down near us. We stay put for nine minutes, and we're gold. John puts the device away and sighs. That was also not what he meant. Here, look at these. Take your mind off things. We got some great shots this trip. He scrolls through the camera's files, excited to share, but John just twitches every time he hears a bang. Look, there's Charlemagne. I got him when his horse reared up at one point. There. Oh, and then Napoleon's victory. And then... He flicks to another one. John cringes. Christopher grins. Look at that. We're the news of Bruder film. You got the Archduke just waiting. I'm sure time will love that one. What's gotten into you? What? You've been a pill this whole trip. I thought you were excited we finally got licensed to do this. I was. So what's the problem? I don't understand how you can be so callous about it. About our jobs? John... You've covered the third massacre at Damascus. I know. These people, they're dead, man. They've been dead. 
We're just here for a minute, we get the photo, and we get out. I want to help too, okay? But there's nothing we can do. I know. It's just... I got tired of all that stuff. War journalism, thinking you can generate some sort of feeling back home. But I always just felt like I was staring through somebody's window, seeing legs blown off or kids getting... Yeah, I remember. Well, you were in your little bunker back home. You ordered those strips. I did not order them. I never ordered any of that shit. I was in surveillance. Well, then you should get it. Watching people like that, just staring at them and not... Why the hell did you take this job, then? I thought it would be easier. The distance, I guess. But it's the same thing again. That's bullshit. It's bullshit. They are fundamentally different things. How? All those drone strikes. I never got it. But with this, it's a chance for us to change things. Maybe not in time for them, but for us, we get to bear witness to something no one was ever going to see. Get the angles no one could ever get. You show somebody a shitty old photograph, they think it's just an artifact. But you show them a famous moment in history in real color and real definition, and you point and say, are we really going to keep that up? Are we really going to do the exact same bullshit as this? Or are we going to be different? Okay? So quit the whole voyeur guilt thing. This is fucking activism. John considers this a moment. I guess that's one way to put it. I don't know, though. I hear those boys out there, and I just... But he is cut off by the whistle of something coming in overhead. They both look up, terror across their faces. No, 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 we're safe here. We're supposed to be safe. John tackles him. Get down! They throw themselves on the floor, and the explosion goes off very near them. A dazed beat. The men start to rise, stunned. They shouldn't be that close to us. The fuel packet said this area was- Maybe you should check the fuel packet again! He tosses the device back to Christopher, who scrambles to verify their safety locations. John is just rattled. He hasn't had to duck from anything like that in a while. He gets out the time machine and starts fiddling with it again. Five more minutes, and we can make another jump. I don't understand. No past elements- Help. Should... Help. The two men go still. Do you hear that? Please. Anyone. What the hell is he doing this far from camp? He must have been hit by that shell. He's a deserter. He's British. Is anyone there? Please. Oh, God. Chris, that was a direct hit. He's not going to make it. Christopher steals himself. He's in surveillance mode now. Try not to listen. Come on, the Allies win this one. It's just four more minutes. He returns to his camera and tries to focus on it once more. But John is still transfixed by the calls. We could... We could go to him. What? You said you wanted to help people. I said I wanted to help people without disrupting the time continuum. We can't interfere. We look to the future. What's it going to affect if we go comfort a dying man? Anything! That could affect anything! We are not allowed to meddle! I'm not saying we meddle, I'm saying we go to him. Please. This doesn't make you crazy? That's the job. How can you keep up this eyes on the trees bullshit when you get this close to it? The hell is that supposed to mean? How could you sit and press those buttons and not understand that things were happening to people? I didn't give those orders! Please. Oh god, please. Look, I'm not saying we drag him back to the future and put him in surgery. I'm saying we go sit with an injured man in his last moments, like human fucking beings. He tears away from Christopher and starts to head towards the sound. John? John! John does not change his course. Christopher reaches deep into his training. What comes next is automatic. He draws a gun from his coat and levels it at his partner's back. Agent Fox, you're out of line. We hear the steely click of a bullet setting into place. John freezes. Nearby, the man's moans continue. Under ISTA Ordinance 56, I am authorized to ensure we do not, under any circumstance, contact, interact, or interfere with any past elements. I am your partner. I outrank you. I have lived through the shit you were too scared to even look at. We could set off a chain of events. The grandfather paradox. The butterfly effect. You're actually going to be a strickler about this. We're not. Go ahead. Shoot me. I've had a gun pointed at me before. When was the last time you could say that? Christopher swallows. He relevels the gun. John doesn't flinch. Are you going to shoot me? Christopher falters. John takes the silence and storms off. Agent Fox! Damn it! He disarms the weapon and throws it down, dashing off after John. A beat. The two men come back on, carrying the man's body between them. He continues to moan. Thanks. Don't push your luck. They deposit the man next to their stuff. John kneels beside him, supporting his head. Christopher hangs back. Who are you with? Red Cross. You're American. American trained. We're working with the Red Cross. I, I thought Red Cross pulled out four days ago. Christopher and John exchange glances. Well, not us. But the man has grown suspicious. He pulls away from John, glaring hard. 
John gives him some space and rises to stand with Christopher. Monkey wrench. What? Monkey wrench. Shit. What? This is a code word. So what do we say? It's something. Tell me the truth. Who are you boys? Do not say Red Cross. We're Red Cross. Monkey wrench. Or I'll... He notices Christopher's discarded gun and grabs it, aiming hard. Instinctively, Christopher and John punch their arms into the air. Whoa, 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 whoa. hey, 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 I will hey, not hey. be taken prisoner by German spies. Now's a good time to remember that code word. I, I, you were supposed to read the field packet. You were supposed to know how to operate an Alcubierre model. Count of three. Wh who do you think would try to take you prisoner? You've got hours left, man. Minutes. Oh, yeah? He arms the weapon with a click. You crowds have less. Whoa, hey, let's calm down. You don't think this might be a weird scheme for taking someone prisoner? Even for the Krauts. That calms the man down a little. I mean, come on. We know the goose stepping is a little ridiculous, but they aren't that crazy. The man laughs through his pain. He's starting to relax when, vroom, 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 the time machine lights up. It's primed and ready to go. It's also scary as hell for someone who doesn't know what it is. The hell is that? The hell is that? The machine starts humming loud. The man redirects the gun at the time machine. John and Christopher both panic. John dives forward to stop him. No, John, no! What the fuck is that? The man fires. John's hit. He falls to the ground. The man re-aims for Christopher. Hold it! Hold it! The man fires again. It only hits Christopher's arm as he dives forward and grabs the gun from John's holster. He fires back. The man slumps. Dead. Christopher hits his knees and holds John up. John. John! He's unresponsive. John, come on, I can't... Come on, you know I can't fix this thing. John? Nothing. Christopher sits there, dazed, as the time machine blinks and hums beside him, and the battle rages on nearby. Blackout. Everybody, welcome back to the Green Light Green Podcast. Light. Thank you, Lauren. This is uh, our second time doing this because Jackson didn't record last there time. There we go. I was going to be the one to bring it up, but now that it's out in the air, that's truthful. That happened. Um, but we're here, and more importantly, we are here with Ellie Baker once again. Ooh. Ellie Baker, the first guest on our podcast, so we'll go down forever in history as that. Um, how are you, Ellie? I'm doing great. Good. How are you guys? We're, we are we are as good as when you asked us the first time we yeah. tried Eight recording ago. this. Yes. Uh. <laughs> you, know? you know, we make mistakes as human beings, <laughs> and we can't go back in time and change that. That's but right. these Ooh. characters go back Damn. in time. I guess they don't really change it. As Hannah Montana once said, nobody's perfect. True. So. And we have to live by that. We have to just love Hannah Montana. That's what I take out of this. Um, so yeah, quarantine. How's that been for you? <laughs> the last time we spoke was like months ago. So like, uh, it's, um, especially because we recorded yours, the first of all of them, and then we didn't release them until we were recorded three. So it's literally been pre quarantine since we last talked to you. Um, yeah, it's been pretty good. I, I went back home to North Carolina, um, finished up the school year and then I, I moved to the beach um on bald head island uh mm. where i'm going to be working and i've been staying here for the past five summers uh working in a restaurant and it's been pretty good it's nice. been kind of working hard and hanging out at the beach when i have a day off that really is nice i know i already said that but the the beach i've always like i've always wanted to like live at the beach <laughs> even if it's just for like a couple months like i feel like i would i would fit in i guess we're like close out here we're, like, actually 20 minutes away actually <laughs> yeah, but i feel like it's different being because like it doesn't feel like the beach where we are. Like, That's it feels true. more because there are palm trees, but, like, it's not like we smell the ocean air every yeah. time we walk outside, you know? We smell the smog instead. So, yeah. um, it, it, it would be cool. Fine. I know. I was, that was for a hyperbole. Lauren is upset with me, and that is understandable and okay. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> let's just dive into the script, uh, in that case. So, um, your first script, which was 
lovely and amazing. No um, homo zombro. No homo zombro. Thank you, Lauren. Um, that one was a comedy, and this one is obviously more like straight up drama. So, like, which which do you prefer? Like, are you a, are you a comedy gal or a, or a drama girl? <laughs> a drama girl. Um, <laughs> I am a drama girl. Okay. Um, I think comedy comedy is hard, as we said earlier. But it's I I think you've really got to be able to pack in more laughs than I'm able to do, and so I think I lean more into um, my strengths are more in a good drama. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I guess even even like even no homo zombro definitely had those dramatic elements For and sure. kind of twisted them in a way that sort of made it into comedy, which yeah. I guess in a way yeah. is kind of what, you know, other comedies do, but as opposed to, you know, some scripts is just like a joke, a line, you know, yeah. it, that's, that's, a, it's a lot harder to keep that up consistently, I guess. Yeah. As I a would comedy. argue No yeah. Homo Zombro is better than Dumb and Dumber. I said it. <laughs> oh you, my God, Lauren! How how you said dare it so you? Loudly. <laughs> we we can't publish this anymore. We're gonna have to start over oh, again. No. Third time. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so uh, with this script specifically, um, one of the things that we really liked was that I have never seen time travel presented this way. So you know, their purpose is not to go back and take something or kill Hitler or make sure you know their mom goes to prom with their dad. It's just to go back and get documentation of events that happened before modern technology was what it was and cameras were what they are today. So where did that idea come from? So this is obnoxious, um, hmm. but this came to me in a dream um, uh, where I think I was I was <laughs> I, I was the photographer at some event. I don't know. I, w- I woke up w- woke up and wrote it down um, and just kind of. What struck me more as interesting was that it, um, in all these movies where you see people do time travel, they always end up messing things up too much, and then right. they can't go back to the home that they knew. And um, that was really interesting to me. So you, you know, you've got like the disappearing hand or whatever. Um, I think that these people have figured out that the only use for time travel they can really have is just to document it. And it's you know they it's imperative that they don't change things that they can't mm-hmm. interact. And so if that's their one rule you know what else is there but to go back and try and preserve as much as you can right of course yeah use use traveling in the one way that you know how speaking of something that you mentioned that's not directly related to the script dreams i feel like i don't have the those as much as i used to when i was a child yeah like i very rarely dream now i feel like I have I I tell you about some weird dreams i have True. sometimes you i do. don't know yeah. it's it's i feel like it goes on and off for me like I don't know, I'll have a year where I just have really vivid, weird action movie dreams all the time, <laughs> and then I'll have ones that are just completely mundane to the point where I think they happened, and then I just have no dreams. How was it for you, Ellie? How was your dream life? <laughs> How are my dreams? Um, that one that one honestly was like middle school. Um, they've gotten a lot more boring since then, <laughs> but um, no, usually I just, I just dream that I'm waking up and going about my morning routine, like brushing yeah. my teeth and turning off my alarm and I'm totally fooling myself into stealing more sleep, uh, which is very dangerous. <laughs> yes, very <laughs> true. I used to, in high school, when I had uh, AP classes, you know, I'd be doing homework until like two, three in the morning, uh, you know, like specifically a push writing down all the note cards and stuff. Oh yeah. And I'd like say, okay, I'm going to get up again. I'm just going to sleep for like a couple hours because I can't keep my eyes open. I'm going to get up at like 5.30 before school starts Mm -hmm. and finish this. And I will dream that I woke up and finished my homework and then actually wake up too late to finish it. Yeah. It's terrible. That's heartbreaking. Even if you wake up on time, it's like, I got to do this again? Like what? Like, let me dream of sunshine and rainbows, not of AP US history. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I guess... Th- this this next question might come from my ignorance on war history, but the Battle of the Scheldt, is that how you pronounce, you pronounce it? I, I should think so. Okay, cool. So wh- oh, why... I know Belgian, but I think so. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. Uh, why choose that one? Because I, I personally never heard of it, but once again, that might be my ignorance on, on World War II history. But yeah, why, why choose this sp- particular battle? Um, why did I choose that one? I think that it was... Let's see. It was a it was a trench battle, um, so I didn't want to do any of like the big ones that you know, like maybe like Battle of Dresden is a big kind of city sure. battle, mm-hmm. um, and then you know Battle of the Bulge is the one that I think people talk about a lot. But sure. that was oh, it was because I needed the Red Cross to be there. I needed a time for them oh. to have moved out in the past two months, and so that was where my research went. 
Um, and so I had to pick one that was a little, um, a little more obscure, but was still, as I, as I found out, I think it was still in one of the top 10 biggest. It has been a while since I did this research. Sure. Um, but yeah, I had to make sure that I had all the, the right players there, uh, yeah. in order to back up the drama that I wanted to tell. For sure. So, so I, that, um, you just saying that, um, sparks a question in my mind. How much research do you typically do for like a, a short film like this? Obviously maybe you had to do a little more for this one than like no homo zombro, but um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, for, for something like this, how, how much research do you typically do? Uh, for something like this a lot. Um, I've done a couple things that were kind of historical narratives, uh, like research based pieces. Um, and I'll put in, I'll put in a lot and a lot of research gets scrapped, but mm. I still think it's really valuable because then you, you're only pulling from the best. Um, yeah. and so, yeah, I find like I used to write the, um, the, the ghost walk at, at where I work. And so I would tell a lot of historical pirate stories and stuff. Oh, and so, yeah, it's really fun. But um, I, you know, would would find that the first draft always had so many unnecessary, like, pirate lingo and weird sure. facts. And too many args. Gonna drop <laughs> yeah, too many args. And also, why did I have to tell them how much a, like, standard cannonball weighed? Like, that wasn't necessary. <laughs> I know I looked that up, but I don't need to say it. Well, how much um, does a standard cannonball weigh, Ellie? I... Why would you ask? It was a while ago. Uh, <laughs> I need to. Pounds. The people need to know, um, Ellie. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think research is really valuable, both for what goes into the script, but also what doesn't go in is equally as important because then it's just more for you to know about your world uh, mm -hmm, that you're sure. working with. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, sort of moving back into the script. So it seems the script seems to indicate that they, uh, Christopher and John, John, Jonathan. Yes. And yeah. I guess, um, they, they've gone back <laughs> in time to war zones before and like other places and haven't changed anything or like helped anyone. Why is this different? Like what makes this specific battle of Shelt different? <laughs> Good question. Um, I think that this was one. So usually they go with, they, the standard operations that they go in, they kind of get some, distant pictures and then maybe they'll kind of like bounce really close and get some close-ups and then get out really quickly and that's mm -hmm. kind of the way that it works is kind of a, a strike and bounce um situation but for this one uh what's different about it is that they're stuck so the, mm -hmm. the time machine breaks down it's overheated and they're stuck for eight minutes um and so i think that being forced to just wait and not really be waiting in like the most prime location to get the best shot mm -hmm. um, forces John specifically to think about what's going on. And so they can't really, there's nothing really to distract him. Um, and he's just kind of forced to reckon with what's going on around them. And, you know, this is the first time where he really gets to voice it. Yeah. Yeah. Just the opportunity when opportunity presents. What sure. will you do? Yeah, it really, it really honestly, you know, I know that the reason that they're stuck there is because it overheated, but it really didn't occur to me before right now that, you know, they literally were in these other places for like 30 seconds or a minute or something, like just a really short period of time. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, so something I thought was really interesting. Uh, so Christopher has a monologue about how seeing pictures in color taken with a modern camera make the events more real for people today. So it helps them, it helps those events be more real to them. It helps them learn from it more. Um, so you sent the script to us months ago when we were first starting the podcast, the same time you sent us No Homo Zombro. And it's really interesting to me that just in the past couple of weeks, I've seen a lot of posts about how many pictures from the civil rights movement were taken yeah, in color. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about. Yeah, but they're, they're put in textbooks in black and white to make them seem kind of more removed from reality. So... I don't know, this is part comment, part question, but I just wanted to see your, I don't know, you predicted the future a little bit, I guess, but for you, really. I just, um, I, I wanted to hear your thoughts on, you know, how important it is for us to see, um, pictures, I guess, in as high definition as we can of past events. Um, yeah, no, that's actually, I'd actually seen those posts before, you know, all of the, the events of the past few weeks. Um, you know, pictures of Martin Luther King in color and, and a lot of the marches taken. I mean, not just like recolorized mm -hmm. in the present day, but they were taken in color because they were not that long ago. I mean, I saw one the other day where um, 
uh, Ruby Bridges is 63. You know, she's yeah. <laughs> she's not that old. And, mm-hmm. like, this was not a long time ago. And so um, I think that, you know, when people do see stuff in black and white, it's such an old there's just a connotation to it. Um, and you know, people tell jokes about like, uh, things were black and white when my grandparents were around. Um, mm. and yeah, I mean, I think, I think that the, the technology is something that we should be using now. I don't, I don't know if this is my place to like be commenting on like photographers, but, um, <laughs> photographers that that listen up, at. please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That like, that was something that was playing into my thoughts. Um, for sure. Yeah, and I mean, it kind of makes yeah. you think, you know, when you see something in black and white, you think, oh, well, so much time has passed, so much, so much must have changed. It, There's no way it's as bad now as it was, you know, that long ago. And yeah, I mean, I think seeing those pictures in color, because I truly, I don't know that I have ever seen a, a color photo of a march from the civil rights movement until pretty recently, and that mm-hmm. was really... I don't know, shocking to me because I, I knew that there were color photos taken in that time, but it just didn't click with me, I guess. So it definitely it definitely makes you think, oh, well, you know, these look pretty similar to the pictures of protests being taken right now that are for the same thing. Um, so, yeah, I yeah. thought that was a really cool thing that you put into the script. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was kind of like what the what the guys end up talking about um, is where was I going with my train of thought there? Um, oh, it is Christopher's frustration that are we going to be doing the same thing as them? Are we going to be out here dying in the mud, battle of shell? This is the exact same stuff that we have in our day. Mm. You know, have, have we, have we changed at all? And that's what he wants to kind of force in front of people's faces. Right. Yeah. That's a really good point. And I think that's a, a lovely segue into my next question. So I, I would love to hear you talk about like the ending and the decision to end on John's death. So with that, are you sort of like, are you kind of confirming Christopher's original point that it's like, hey, if we get involved, something bad could happen and then that could change the future? Or is, is there something else that you were you were trying to say by ending with that and just to include John's death in, in general? Um, so there were different rewrite plans around this that I didn't actually end up getting to because hmm. um, I, I, there were just different ways to execute it that I never felt solid about sure um but i i don't know because in one way it's saying that that john's hopes were kind of futile which i don't actually agree with and i wanted to find a better way of including the irony of his actions and sort of the frustration of this like cyclical i don't want to say that activism is is hopeless that's not at all what i'm trying to say but yeah the, the show and tell nature of what they were doing was what John was so frustrated about and, you know, ultimately kind of participating in it was what um, was his undoing. Mm-hmm. And in one sense, that was kind of what I was going for, but I wanted to find a better way to sort of uplift what, what his hopes were. And I never, I never did find a perfect version. Sure. Um, and I think, um, I think it's interesting too, cause it's like, you know, a, a big reason why John was dead is because neither of them like were really prepared enough going into it. Cause you know, That's if true. they, if they would have known the code word, then John probably would still be alive to this day. Yeah. Um, and so I think, I think therein kind of lies that like, sort of like the, the showy commentary that you're talking about. It's like, you know, if they were prepared and if they were actually wanting to help people, you know, if, if that, if that was the idea, then maybe they, they could be more prepared and better, better equipped to do that. But, you know, not just this going in and out and, you know, this sort of showy activism in a way doesn't necessarily lead to, to good things. Yeah. 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 Um, so to, you know, that was kind of the, the end of the really hard questions, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to throw a few softballs now. Yeah. Uh, so okay. I'm ready. <laughs> so what is one historical moment that you'd like to see captured and documented with you know, modern photography? Um, oh Lord, that's a good one. Um, I mean, as far as sort of what would be the most fun, I think that the Rococo era in France was Mm. pretty, pretty out there. Um, 
it's just sort of a luxurious moment to sort of capture. But I think that the the most interesting and I think the most valuable moments to preserve. Um, I don't know. I think it's just sort of the resilience of human life, like the mm. the continuity of what things have been, what has been the same, um, mm. and just sort of connecting yourself with the people who have been here forever, because you know life didn't really change for so long, for so many generations, and in the past hundred or two hundred years, things have just escalated so quickly, yeah, generation mm. to generation, and I think that we've really kind of lost you know, we've, we've lost touch with what people used to do and what life used to be like. Um, yeah. And like what life used to be like really not all that long ago in the grand scope of things. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just thinking, I'm thinking of like, I don't know, bread making. Like, I think that that would be interesting to see people making bread or making concrete, um, (laughs) uh, just sort of daily life of, you know, people living year after year. Yeah. Those, those, those tiny moments. Highlight those. Lift yeah, those I think tiny Super moments cool. are fun. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, so another another fun old question. Uh, what is your favorite time travel movie? There are a lot. Um, oh, I listed some uh, if, if you need help. But if you have one off the top of your mind, go for it. I, I do. I do. Ooh. I love Looper. Oh, Looper is so good. So good. I love Looper it's so, so much. It's so good. <laughs> um, God, my, my boy Joseph Gordon love it. Um, <laughs> it. Yeah, I think that that's another fun one where they don't rely on time travel being the crux of the story. It's just mm-hmm. sort of mm-hmm. some. It's just sort of incidental to the the lives that they're leading. That this is, you know, it's like it's like the bureaucracy of time travel, like the, like the like the bullshit that they have to. I'm sorry, uh, the stuff that they have to put up with um, because of this thing. And it's just, I don't know. It's a fun world that they live in. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it is really interesting because I don't know I feel like it's like a it's a very gritty look at time travel but also something that you know could potentially become a real thing you know yeah. it's like it's, yeah. it's 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 so cool because you know I feel like a lot of times uh, like it's not always but sometimes you have this like really um, exalted view of time travel like it's so cool we can go back in time and obviously conflict still mm-hmm. arises from that but i feel like looper is so much more grounded and so much more gritty yeah that it's like you yeah know, it, it 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 paints a it paints a more realistic picture of maybe what time travel could yeah. become yeah yeah like the premise starts out in like what the inconveniences of time travel are exactly like mm-hmm. not the not the glamour of it but the oh we've got to put up with this again yeah, um, yeah. and then that's and then that's where the story starts rolling which i think is just really funny because you know the moment that anything starts to exist we find a way to make it boring oh yeah um <laughs> oh do we <laughs> that's, that's, that's the world that they're living in yeah 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 so uh to finish out you know we want you to talk about another movie or book or something that you would enjoy and recommend like looper Mm -hmm. um so what is your detour of the week yeah did did you hear when we were talking about our detours like uh, like it's just basically yeah like lauren said just uh, some something you've watched or consumed Uh, the past week i can keep it up okay good good Um, (laughs) um love my favorite podcast um well i've been been reading dune um and i'm really loving it um It's the the sci-fi novel from 1965. It got adapted by David Lynch in the 80s, and it's going to be a new movie soon. Um, I did not know that it was adapted in the 80s. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, Sting is really weird. Oh, that Um, is weird. (laughs) (laughs) Super weird. Um, But no, it's really it's um sort of this royal family moves to a new planet uh, and they're, they're going to be taking over the mining operations there. And uh, I'm only about 120 pages in. So like the, the good stuff hasn't started rolling yet, but um, they, they're dealing with sort of an incipient uh, civil war that they're sort of inheriting from the last regime and the, the, it's from the young prince's point of view and kind of how he's, he knows that he's going to have to be, the ruler over all this mess and mm. kind of his anticipation of it. So it's really exciting. Um, and yeah, it's going to be a movie. I'm really excited for it. So I want to awesome. read the book ahead of time. Yeah, that is really cool. I'm very excited for the, uh, the new movie that's coming out, uh, with, uh, directed by Denis Villeneuve should be, should be very good. Um, <laughs> yep. yeah. 
So I think that's all we have for you, Ellie. Uh, I know we asked you this before, but do you have anything that you would like to plug? Ah, uh, no, not so much. Okay. Nothing, well, nothing in particular. We will, if you like this script, if you like No Homo Zombro, we will be including Ellie's information in our description. Yeah. Also, we'll be including our own social links, TGL underscore pod for Twitter and Instagram, and The Green Light on Facebook, right? Yes. That's, that's our, official, our official title. Yeah. So go on there, follow us, like us, uh... Like we said earlier in the episode, rate and review us on iTunes and roast me. Just roast everything out of me. And yeah, anything else that we have, Lauren? I don't think so. Thanks for listening, everybody. And thank you, Ellie. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Yeah, all right. Bye, everyone. See you next week. See you next week. Bye. Bye.